mindset is the most important. And I tweet it today uh, that uh, it was it was a little uh, blurb from my book, but uh, Mark Spitz, who won uh, Olympic gold three times, said. Uh, that it's 99% psychological. Um, and I also quoted uh, Jack Nicholas. So, you know, anybody, if you can, Michael Phelps, you ask any of these, uh, Michael Jordan, if you were to ask any of these champions how important mindset is, they would tell you that it's the most important thing. This is the How to Trade Stocks Options podcast, brought to you by 10MinuteStockTrader.com, where we cover finance, stocks, options, entrepreneurship, education, and money. And here's your host, voted one of the top 100 people in finance, Christopher Ewell. Hey, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified every time we give you more tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter every single week. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. Today, I have a special, special guest. He's been on once before, and I am so thrilled to have him back on again today. Mark Minervini. Mark is the 1997 U.S. investing champion and a number one selling, uh, best-selling author. He has authored several books, including Mindset Secrets for Winning, Think and Trade Like a Champion, Trade Like a Stock Market Wizard, and co-authored Momentum Masters, which I've lost a jacket to. But I am so excited to have Mark back on the podcast today. And today we're going to be talking about mindset and how important that is to trading. Mark, thank you so much for coming back on the show today. No, thanks for having me. I got to tell you, I've been uh, I've been fanboying real hard over here, being able to uh, have you back on the show. Um, I went and reread all the books in preparation for this, and you know what really struck me was um, think and trade like a champion. About half of it was like trading suggestions, trading topics, and the other half really was thinking about trading like a champion. What inspired you to? M- to make this one about half about mindset. And then also what got you into creating this one? Well, you know, first of all, the think and trade like a champion. The reason why I wrote that book was because on the the first book, trade like a stock market wizard is missing some things. It doesn't have a section on selling um, position sizing. There's some elements that just couldn't fit. The book was only so big and McGraw Hill wanted a number, certain number of pages. So, that was the first thing. Second of all, um, mindset is very important, you know. So it's think and trade like a champion because, uh, you know, where the mind goes, everything else follows. And you know, you can have all the rules, you can, and and I can give you all the rules and give you the strategy. But if you're not, you're not in the right mindset, your your, your emotions are going to get in the way of your discipline, and you're not going to be able to execute it. So more important than anything is is the mindset part. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So where did you get the mindset? I know reading through these books and hearing your backstory, it didn't it didn't start with, you know, silver spoon in your mouth. I'm going to be obviously a stock market investing champion. How did you get the mindset? Where did that come from? Yeah, well, to say that I didn't start with a silver spoon is an understatement. <laughs> I mean, I, I started, of course, about as poor as you possibly can and with a lot of uh, difficulty uh, growing up as far as having a very tough environment and violence in my home and all kinds of things that would uh, would cause you to have a very poor mindset. And I did have a very poor mindset. Um, luckily, my parents you know, loved me very much and always encouraged me. And I did have a lot of love in my life, but, uh, but I, I saw a lot of negative things. And it was a very, like I said, a very difficult upbringing. So it took me uh, it took me a lot of work, you know, to get my mindset to be thinking like a winner because, um, you know, at the time I just, uh, you know, I, I went to, uh, try to play sports and things when I was really young and my mother had to work and, uh, you know, I, my, she was a single parent and I had nobody there and all the other kids had their, their families there cheering for them. And I, you know, I just felt overwhelmed that I, you know, I couldn't compete. Uh, they just seemed to have so much support and I had none. I was all by myself. So for a young kid, you know, eight, nine, 10 years old, uh, that that's a, that's a tough environment. Um, uh, but a lot of books, a lot of reading, a lot of seminars, um, I recently tweeted a list of books that were life-changing for me. Wayne Dyer was uh, a huge mm. influence on me. Uh, Anthony Robbins, of course, uh, uh, Tony Robbins' son, uh, Jarek, was mm. one of my uh, instructors a couple of years back at the Master Trader Program. Um, and, uh, you know, so I have about 4,000 books in my library. And I've read every one of them and some of them 30, 40 times, um, including 
books like A Course, uh, a Course in Miracles. And uh, um, so I have, why do I have all those books? Because I needed them. And I, and I probably still need them. Uh, so we're all, we're all a work in progress and I'm a work in progress now as well. So what would you say would be your number one book? I wouldn't say there is a number one book, but um, I can't, I couldn't narrow it down to just one book, but I did put a list, I think of 10 on Twitter that were some of the most influential books that I have read. And those who were four of them were uh, Wayne Dyer books. One was uh, unlimited power by Anthony Robbins. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Peace Pilgrim is an, is an amazing book. It's uh, just, you have to read that to even uh, Google or go on Amazon and look for Peace Pilgrim. Uh, just an amazing woman. Uh, so yeah, there's, you know, like I said, there's probably, uh, you know, a hundred books that uh, were wonderful and that uh, out of all these books that I have, you know, not, not all of them, most of them are finance, a lot of them are finance, uh, but basically my library consists of books on motivation, business, finance, and uh, spirituality. Those are, that pretty much encompasses almost my whole library. I, I don't know if I have maybe three novels in my entire life. Oh, library. wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so did you feel that getting the mindset right was more important or less important than your strategies? Because I know like your first book was a lot about the strategies and your second book was half about the strategies, half about the mindset and your third book, Mindset Secrets. It, it, it's all about the mindset. Right. And I have a guess as to what your answer is going to be. Mindset is the most important. And I tweet it today uh, that uh, it was it was a little uh, blurb from my book. But uh, Mark Spitz, who won uh, Olympic gold three times, said uh, that it's 99 percent psychological. Um, and I also quoted, uh, Jack Nicholas. So, you know, anybody, if you can, Michael Phelps, you ask any of these, uh, Michael Jordan, if you were to ask any of these champions, how important mindset is, they would tell you that it's the most important thing. And there's a reason why champions will tell you that. And that's why they're champions. Because like I said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you get all the right information, if you can't execute it, if you can't have discipline, if you can't have belief in yourself, if you can't have the confidence that it takes to get through the tough times, all that is all based on your psychology. So what do you think makes a difference in somebody that has a, a winning mindset and, and somebody who doesn't like, what does it take to move from where they are to where they want to be? Well, there's a number of things. And in mindset secrets, I outline some key uh, rules of, uh, of, a, of a winner, if you will. Um, and, and one of them is believing that winning is a choice, believing in choice, believing in choice is really important because if you don't believe in choice, then you you can very easily feel unlucky. You don't feel like you have any control over the situation. So, you know, believing in choice and cultivating the ability to respond, which is responsibility. That is what responsibility is. Cultivating the ability to respond, knowing that you can't control practically anything except your own responses. And, but that's all you need to control. And, and that's what you want to cultivate is being, having a real, a uh, strong ability to respond and eventually, you know, respond in ways that, uh, you know, make things work for you, of course. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because like as, as a trader, uh, your job is to respond to what the market gives you when you agree. Yeah. You can't control what a stock does. You have, you only con you have control over a couple of things, you know, how much you buy, when you buy, what you buy and where you, you know, sell or you cut your loss. So those things you have direct control over, but you don't have any control of whether the stock is going to be profitable, uh, how much it goes up, you know, what the market's going to do when you get opportunities, you know, when, when the opportunities arise, all you can do is prepare for opportunity and be ready for it. And when it comes uh, take advantage of it as best you can um, and minimize the difficulties and minimize the risks and, and exploit the uh, opportunities. So, you know, being able to really have that mapped out where you're, and, and you know, the people always ask me, you know, what's the mindset you know, to go in as a trader or go into the trading day or, you know, what is your mindset? Prepared. That's the mindset. Prepared, you know, totally prepared. When I go into a trading day or any trade, I'm completely, totally prepared. There's really nothing that can happen that I don't know pretty much what my response is going to be. 
So I, I'm empowered and, you know, I feel it's, it's, it's empowering to know that you've got basically, you know, you've got all the bases covered. Do you still find at times that you're ever like excited at the market or anxious at the market or because you have your plan, those emotions don't become a part of it? Uh, anxious. No. I mean, it, I get excited if, you know, I see a lot of stocks were setting up and working and think, you know, it's wonderful to see things work and you map out a plan and everything starts working even more than the money. I mean, at this point, you know, the money's great, but that really hasn't motivated me for a long time. It, it really never motivated me. I mean, in the beginning, you know, I, I wanted to get rich, of course, because I was poor and that's what poor people dream about, you know, but I would still be trading today if I spent the last 37 years losing, <laughs> I'd probably still be trading because I would still be, you know, I have a, a, a an attitude that I'm going to keep going and, and, and die trying, you know? So I, I and the, that, the reason why I can do that is because I love what I'm doing, you know? So passion is a really important that you're passionate about what you're doing. You know, people say, well, what does it take to be a great, great trader? And, you know, what are the attributes and so forth? Well, First of all, how are you passionate about it? You know, is that something that you really, really enjoy? I mean, if you're just doing it just, just because you want money, it's going to be tough. It's going to be, it's going to be tough because, you know, you're probably not going to see the money for a while or it might be temporary and then they take it away from you because you don't really know what you're doing in the beginning. So the money is not going to be there uh, in, in the beginning. You know, that reminds me, um, so you've previously been on an episode with Mike Lamoth and he sent me his uh, mindset guide that he recently published. And the very first question is, why do you trade? And for me, I, I took a step back and I'm like, I never really thought about why I trade. I, at first I'm like, well, of course to make money. But then I was like, there's been a lot of times where I wasn't making money and I kept trading. And I was like, I think it was for the love of the game. Like I really mm. enjoy the process, the puzzle, the the experimentation, the the gamification of it, and it sounds like maybe that's the case for you. Well, the key you just said it. The key is the process. That is the key. Loving, enjoying the process. That's the journey. Okay, so you have to enjoy the journey and not just the the destination. The destination, once you reach it, it's over. The journey is the whole. You know, the ride starts. You get on a roller coaster, and then it ends. You know, at the end, it's over. You're, you're enjoying the ride and the thrills and, 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 you know, what's happening during the ride. So same thing with trading. And like I always say, and, and, you know, I talk about this in my book, you know, a lot of people will ask me, well, what do you do when you feel like giving up or when it's really tough? And that's where your why is challenged. That's where you have to go back to your why. So you get challenged and things are going bad. You have to say, okay, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Well, if the reason is good enough, you will re up. You'll you you will re up to the challenge, and you and you will you you will pull yourself up and get back to work if your why is strong enough. But that's when your why gets tested. So yeah, you got to have a good why. That that's that's a, that's the first thing is you know having a really strong why. Absolutely. So let's let's dive into the book here. And um, you know, one thing I don't know if uh, if you've ever done this. But I went out and I got, um, let's see, I went to the, uh, this is actually like a fake note. I got it from the Halloween store and okay. it was in like the pimp section, <laughs> and had all these gold chains and it had this money launcher gun. And then it had these, uh, these, these hundred dollar notes that like, they almost look counterfeit. I mean, they're looks real. They are real good. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I bought, it was probably $20,000 worth of these fake hundreds. Right. Wow. And, um, not like actual 20,000, you know, 20 fake thousand, yeah. like 10 bucks worth, <laughs> but <laughs> still a lot of, a lot of them, <laughs> ton of them. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, I can use these all over the place. So they're my bookmarks. I give them <laughs> my kids for bookmarks. And like, there's just something about having yourself surrounded by, you know, Ben Franklin that kind of yeah. like motivates you. Right. Like mm -hmm. I could have anything in here, but for this, like it, it, it may not be about the money, but money is the, the objective in a trade. And if I can surround myself, even with fake notes, I kind of like build my confidence to that. I really like that. I don't know. Just something I, I picked up and I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting and worth sharing. So, all right. Hey, whatever so does it, man, whatever does it, you know, at one time I used to put up pictures of, you know, 
Ferraris and Lamborghinis and and Rolls Royces and big houses and and uh, and money would motivate me, like you're saying now. That doesn't motivate me anymore, to be honest with you. So you know now there's different things that motivate me, and and so but whatever motivates you at the time, yeah, that which that's what you have to use to be able to uh, get yourself up in the morning and and do what you got to do to get to that goal. Absolutely. So so let's jump into parts of the book, right? One of the things that I love, I, the first time I read this, so this came out in 2019 and I picked it up right after that. And I remember reading this at the time and thinking, this is a big deal, right? So I'll, also like I had totally ruined my books. I don't know if mm-hmm. you're like this with uh, your 4,000 books, but I've got yes, tabs, I've got highlighters, I've got like every page is just totally ruined. I do so, the same thing. You must be like me. You're super pragmatic. And then you want to go back and read your highlights and yes, exactly. underline those and then put a star next to them in a circle. And yeah, yeah, it, it, that, that reminds me um, inside of your think and trade like a champion, your, your stars and circles on the stocks that you. Uh, that, that's correct. Yep. So, OK, so what, what caught me on that page was um, celebrate, celebrate and dance to the music is, is the, the title uh, yeah. of this section. But you talk about learn how to immerse yourself in the feeling of success and the reinforcing statement of that's just like you. Like, imagine you got a winning trade. That's just like me. You had a great day. That's just like me. You, you, you did something successful. That's just like me. Instead of saying the old cliche of like when people get things wrong and it's, that's just my luck. Oh, that's how things go for me. Right. I love the, the fist pumping attitude. Like, yeah, that's exactly how things are supposed to work for me. I love that. Like that struck me so hard and I carried that for years. Right. So what's what's most important about that is not just saying that's like me, but but the reason why I I, I talk about celebrating is that you want to actually create emotion around it. The key to getting a winning mindset is to create as much emotion as you can around your wins. Yes. And minimize the emotion around your mistakes and your losses, because when you are very emotional around an event. You build a you build a frame around it. Okay, I call it emotive framing. You build a frame. You build this emotional frame, and it becomes very meaningful in your subconscious. It, it, it this big frame takes up space. So you want to build big frames around your wins and small frames or no frames around your losses, and that goes into your subconscious, and your subconscious tells you, "Hey, you're a winner." You know, I've got all these, all this proof. I've got all these images with these big frames around them and all this great feeling around it. So whenever you, you know, and the, and the way I saw a lot of questions today on Twitter, you know, asking about emotions and controlling it when you're having a losing streak, the thing that you want to do is instead of getting emotional, get curious, get curious, say, what, what happened here? What can, what is there to learn here? I'm curious as to what went wrong and what I can learn from this. And then the emotion goes away. You start looking at it, you know, very practically and you minimize that emotion. And then when things go really good, you know, dance, celebrate, go out for dinner that night and get lobster tails and, and, and celebrate with your wife or your girlfriend or your friends and really try to try to make sure that you create a mo. And a lot of, most people don't do that. They don't do, they just, you know, their, their, their good times come and they move on. They don't really uh, uh, cement that emotion and, and attach it into their subconscious. No, there was one thing I, I think it's in think and trade like a champion where you talk about, even if you have a losing trade, if you followed your plan, that in itself is something to celebrate. Absolutely. I I mean, I don't feel uh, one iota of regret when I get stopped out of a trade um, because I've already come up with a plan and I've already decided what I'm going to risk. So there's no emotion at all when it hits that stop loss or, or, you know, I, I, I get sold out of the position. It, 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 it's already been decided, you know, I've already been now what happens is most people, they'll make a plan, but it wasn't a very good plan in the first place or well thought out. So now they get, they start getting near their stop loss or maybe not even near their stop loss. It gets, you know, maybe their stop loss is $3,000 loss. Now it gets to 1,000 and 1,200 and 1,500 and they're panicking and they sell because really they didn't have a $3,000 threshold, right. emotional threshold. They really had a thousand dollar threshold. And now all of a sudden, you know, that plan goes out the window and what happens? You sell it at 
you know, $1,400 loss. It never hits the 3000 turns around, goes up, takes off, and it would have been a $10,000 win. And, and now you're, and now what you just did is just the opposite because you're going to be all emotional and pissed off at yourself and saying, I suck. And, 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 and now you create the mindset of a loser, you know, you, not that you personally are a loser, but you create the thoughts that attach that emotion, build a frame. And now that reminds you that, you don't make good choices. You don't, you don't respond well. So that's why you, you want to minimize the emotion around that. And, and, and again, if you have a plan, you know, you're, and you're prepared, there's, there's really no emotion. You just execute. You know, also um, something that helps me a lot. And I've talked to a lot of other people on the podcast that, that they're this way too, is I turn off my open P and L and just look at the price of the stock. Right. I mean, you yeah. can do mental math and figure out where your, your P and L is at. But when I know, you know, my, my exit is $99 and it's at 99.05, I'm, I'm getting anxious, obviously, but it's not like, oh, I'm losing X number of dollars. For me, that, that helps a ton. Is that something you do or do you always keep your open PL on? I, I tell people all the time, one of the worst things you can do is especially put that open PL that shows like your whole portfolio. Yeah. You know, so then you're having a bad day and everything's down and it, and it just keeps ticking. You know, you're down, whatever you're in down, you know, 6,000, then it goes to 6,500 and 7,000 and, and you're just watching the money drain out of your account. Yeah. It gets very emotional. And I would, I would stay away from that. You're better off to work in percentages and, you know, keep that maybe up on your screen. And then, mm -hmm. you know, again, have, you know, have everything pre thought out too. So if it is pre thought out, you don't really need to see that. You already know where you're getting out. It doesn't, you all, already factored all that in it's all mm -hmm. baked into the cake already absolutely so there is uh one section of the book page 104 um i love this quote so much finally contemplate the question what would a champion do here that one hit me so hard mark that that was my wall wallpaper screen on my computer yeah. it said what would a champion do right now and i'm like i think this guy knows what he's talking about well, you know, that's something that somebody actually just tweeted that I think yesterday to me, then they said, or maybe it was today. I can't remember. I read it, but it, it's, it's funny because I said to myself, you know, that that's precisely what I'm, I'm suggesting is that now, you know, again, it could, you can pick whoever you, you want to use as that figure. But this particular person said to me, you know, I was in a trade today and I, and I said to myself, what would Mark do here? And mm. he said, and I, and I got it, I got the answer. So I, that was great that I could be of assistance and not be there. <laughs> but, but again, but again, you know, yes, that, that's what I do. I do the same thing. I, you know, I used to say, what would Paul Tudor Jones do here? You know, well, oh, what yeah. would, uh, you know, yeah. What would a great show, what, what would uh, uh, Stanley Druckenmiller do in this market? You know, and, and you, that's, those are the kind of questions you want, you know, you want to ask because you're going to get imp very empowering answers. Um, when you ask what would a champion do here? What would, what would his response, how would he handle that? How would, you know, how would Nelson Mandela handle being in prison? You know, you're in prison. You say to yourself, how would, how did, what would, Nel what would Nelson, Nelson Mandela do here? And we know what Nel Nelson Mandela would do, <laughs> you know? So, so uh, again, very empowering. Yes. Well, I just got to say, um, this book is phenomenal and uh, we're going to have a link down below where people can grab it on Amazon. And I highly, highly suggest that if you haven't had a chance to check out mindset secrets for winning um, or any of other Mark's books, make sure you do that right away. And Chris, I, yes. not to interrupt, I'm sorry, but I know I told you my back was hurting and I only had a certain amount of time, but we can, I, I'm, I'm okay. We can go longer if you want. Oh, great. I'll take it. I was yeah, actually yeah. going to transition to the, the tw Twitter questions if that's all right with you. Yeah, sure. All right, let's do that. So, oh, this is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm going at it cold. Tell you what, let's do this. <laughs> <Me> I'm <too>. going <laughs> to I'm going to screen share and we're just going to see how this goes together. Hang on a second here. Um share screen, screen 2, share. All right, can you see my Twitter screen? Oh yeah. Okay, cool. So, trees nuts. <laughs> this person asks. I mean, it's a decent question. Um the emotional toll of losses seems to be well discussed, but I rarely hear about the emotional toll of handling gains, selling too early, um, I, I guess he's saying uh, expediting gains much faster yeah. than planned. Would love to hear some discussion on the anxiety and mental stress of holding gains. Interesting question. It's a great question because it's, 
I think it's a lot harder than even once you, you, you get the discipline down your, your, you subscribe to, you know, managing your risk and cutting losses, uh, that becomes one of the easiest decisions to make because it's really set in stone. And it's something that you come up with even before the trade selling at a profit or in for protecting your gains. That is probably the hardest thing. That's one of, that is one of the most difficult things emotionally. The, the, the way that you, you have to really have a plan and, and go in there and realize that, look, you're going to have to sacrifice. If, you, if you're going to be a short-term trader, then you're going to have to sacrifice the big move. And if you're going to go for big moves, you're going to have to sacrifice short-term moves. You're going to have a stock that goes up. You play it for a bigger move. It comes all the way back down and it stops you out. On the other hand, you're going to have a stock that goes up, you sell it at a 10% gain, and now it goes up 30 or 40% from there. Okay, so either way, you are, you know, you're going to be wrong, right? Whether you make money, lose money, either way, you feel wrong. See, that's, you, you can't put yourself in that position. If you, if you have a plan and your plan is to make more than you risked, a certain multiple of what you risked, protect that gain. Um, you know, maybe there's a you know certain percentage that is a is a, a good profit relative to what you normally. If you normally average ten percent, well, if the stock is up twenty percent. You're two times your average. You're improving your average. So that's great. That would that's a great time to think about selling. But here's a psychological win win, and I and this is I've discussed this in both my books, and a lot of people I know where you're going here. Up. Yeah, you know where I'm going. Sell half. So, so you know, if you sell half when you're indecisive, you get in a psychological win-win position where if it goes higher, you say, you know, thank God I held half. If it goes lower, you say, thank God I sold half. Either way, you're psych you're you're emotionally protected. I mean, of course, then you have to sell that half at some point and you get back right back to square one. But that's the way, you know, that's one of the ways when you're when I'm indecisive, I usually I usually cut my position down. I cut it and, and you got to cut it in half because anything other than half, then you're more right than you are wrong on one of the sides. So half it has to be half to, for you to be emotionally and psychologically protected on both sides. Mm, that makes so much sense. So I really appreciate you going through that. Let's uh, let's move on to uh, this one here. How do you handle seeing your portfolio under pressure? Even when sell rules are not triggered, which we kind of talked about a few minutes ago. Profit shrinking down, lots of emotions. How do you deal with that? Again, if you have emotions, then that means that you didn't you you didn't have a plan going in or a plan that you really um, that you were really committed to. That that so again, you know, you have to we say sell down to the sleeping point or the pillow factor where you know if positions are making you nervous overnight, then you're trading too large. Well, again, if you're having a drawdown. Um, you should know. You, uh, one of the things you should know is when you get yourself, a lot of people will go in, they'll just buy, 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 buy. Next thing you know, they're all loaded up. And they didn't even think about what happens on that big down day when everything's down. You know, sort of like when you're on the crap table and you, you know, you start rolling and then you, you, you know, you give me the, buy, let me buy the four and then I'll, I'll take uh, the, the six and the eight. And before you know it, you got money scattered all over the table and then seven out, boom, you lose all the bets, right? So you make these little incremental bets as, as you're moving you know, up the ladder, but then one roll of a seven and you lose them all at one time. That's exactly what happens in the market. So you really got, you should know uh, what your total risk you know, of, of equity is at any one time. So if you have, you know, 10 positions and you figure out all your stops and your average uh, stop is 5%. So then, you know, you've got a 5% risk into principle it now, but you also got to take a look at where you are with all your positions that are at profits. Mm -hmm. You know, how much are you going to give back on those? Where, where are you protecting those profits? If you're going to let them all come all the way back down, you know, you might be giving a big, uh, you know, a, allowing a big drawdown that you're not ready for because again, you didn't plan for it. So all these things need to be planned for and you, you won't, you won't be under such pressure when you have a plan that's already been well thought out. You know, that reminds me of, um, you know, Michael Covell, right? Of course. I love Michael Covell. Yeah. He's, he's great. I have, I have asked him on the podcast and he's like, listen, Chris, I don't do outbound podcasts. I only do inbound. And I'm like, ah, okay. we got to figure this out. <laughs> one day. Uh, but in his uh, turtle trading book. So Mark, one of my goals this year is to read a hundred books and I'm on track for that. Awesome. Um, and uh, obviously I'm going through like 80 trading books or so that I've got on hand. Um, but going through the turtle trading book, he talked about specifically what you were just talking about there. He's like the turtles, they will add on um, 
you know, positions at every end point for them. And he said, there are times where they will have huge open profits. And by the time they exit the trade, it's actually at a loss because the market's reversed against them. And that can be super frustrating. And how that kind of ties into this question here. How do you focus and follow through on your plan when your plan's working and then everything falls around around you, fall, falls around you? Well, that's an easy one because your plan should include a plan for everything falling around, falling around you. <laughs> that, that's part, that should be part of your plan. So if, if everything's falling around you and you don't know what to do, well, that means you didn't plan for everything falling around you. Mm. That should be part of your plan. I mean, I, 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 there's, I'm never in that situation ever. You know, under any circumstance, am am I in that situation? Let me ask you this. Yeah. Is there going to be an audio book for Mindset Secrets for Winning? There already is one. Oh, there is. Yep. There are, it's recorded. It just hasn't been released. So I'm not sure when that'll happen, but there is one that's been recorded. Did you, uh, did you hire somebody for it or did you, did you do it? I did hire somebody. I just didn't have the time. I would have liked to done it myself, even though, I don't know if I would have been the best voice or the best diction, but, uh, but yeah, but I, I got someone to do it. You know, I, uh, do you know Gary V Gary Vaynerchuk? I know, I know of him. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, I listened to one of his books that he, he recorded on, um, on audible and he's like, listen, I'm going to screw this up and I'm going to add some things here or there. Cause it's my book. I get to do what I want. That's <laughs> so, right. So maybe next time Mark gets to do what he wants in it. So Ed Sakota says, everyone, gets out of the market what they want. Ed Sakota being the market wizard. Um, I'm a huge fan of Ed Sakota. Can this possibly imply that some of us have deep rooted issues that deny us from being a successful trader? And if so, what type of issues? And I think that ties in a lot to our mindset secrets for winning book. Oh boy, does it ever. I mean, that's what I really talk about. And that's what I talk about how to change that uh, because that was me. You know, I had, I had where I had to change myself from not believing that I was empowered or as good as someone else because they had a better upbringing or whatever the situation was. They had more money. They had more talent. Um, You know, the most talented person, you know, very seldom turns out to be the one that makes it to the top. There's the, the the streets are littered with talented people. Um, But, but, uh, you know, it's the one who can believe in themselves and persevere and, and learn. Uh, So, you know, yes, we all have, <laughs> we certainly all have issues. And, and the thing is, is that we tend, and I, I tweeted this today because I knew I was going into this mindset uh, interview today. So I had mindset, you know, on my mind. Um, we tend to keep our problems around us and, and cling to them. My mother was a perfect example. She just couldn't get out of a poverty mentality, no matter what. She just couldn't believe in, you know, be, her being, wealthy or having really a great life because it just always was that way. And that just scared her, you know, to go into this other realm of somewhere where that she wasn't comfortable and she wasn't comfortable being around rich people. And, um, she just couldn't, you know, couldn't believe in it and cling to her idios, you know, cling to her neurotic thinking. Um, and that's what we do because it reminds us who we are. Uh, it makes us feel like us. And, and, and we feel like, what would we do if we didn't like, if we, if this wasn't me, what would I do? I wouldn't know who I am if I didn't think this way. So we cling to that stuff. And, um, the, the way out of that is to, you know, visualize a new, a new way of, of, of thinking, a new way of living and to actually be in that, uh, in that new mindset. And, you know, ha- there's a whole section on visualization in my book and, and, uh, self-talk and all these things, but it gets a lot deeper than that. So, um, um, but, but yeah, I don't even know what was the question. I always do this and I drift away. Uh, from it's, the it's, question. it's good. Um, you know, uh, the idea, like as Dakota says, everyone gets out of the market, what they want. And, you know, oh, yeah. um, absolutely for the first few years of trading, I couldn't do anything but lose. And I know, um, you were saying in your books that the first, I think you said six years of your trading, that was very unprofitable to you. 
Right. And that's when you get tested. Do you really want it? What do you really want? You want, do you want to, you know, something easy that just comes to you easy? And is this just about making some quick money and a get rich quick scheme? Or, or is, do you really want long-term success that you're committed to the process and you enjoy what you're doing? But just to go back to, I want to go back to a quick story about my mom. You know, when I, I, I made my first big, it was my first big deal, if you will. Um, and I had a, a check that was written out to me. It was a, a check for over a million dollars. It was a one point three million dollars. I came to my mother's house and I put it on the kitchen table and I said, take a look at this. Um, and she looks at it and she goes, oh my God, this is amazing. Holy cow, my God, $13,000. Where did you, where did you get this? And I, <laughs> and I said, no, no. I said, take another look. I said, it's a little bit bigger than that. She goes, oh, oh my God. She started crying and she got all red and she goes, $130,000. Where did you ever get this? What? Oh my God, 130,000. What are you going to do with $130,000? I said, Ma, take another look. She looks at it, looks at me. She goes, what am I looking for? I said, it's 1.3 million. She says, no, no, it's 130,000. I said, no, it's 1.3 million. She goes, no, it's not. She literally couldn't see it. She, she couldn't believe it. She just couldn't believe that her son, that she you know, brought up through the, uh, <laughs> through the years and, and came to this point where he could get this big check. She couldn't believe it. She just could not see it. And I had to go back and forth with her so many times and she just kept telling me, no, 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 it's not. And I'm like, yes, it is. I know the check I just got written. <laughs> that is so interesting. That's like the literal and the subconscious together right there. She was like, literally her vision was like blocked. She just couldn't, wow. couldn't see it. I, I just, that was so, that moment, was so eye-opening to me and made me see how much that I needed to understand why my mother was like that and to never to be like that, <laughs> to be honest with you. You know, I learned a lot from my, my mother, uh, from positive example for uh, love and compassion. Uh, but when it comes to uh, thinking uh, like a winner and a champion, and uh, I didn't learn that at my home. You know, I had to, I had to get that from people outside my home. Was that before or after you bought the four thousand dollar green chair? Oh, uh, let's see. The four thousand dollar <laughs> green chair came be be actually before that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I love that, that story. Yep. Yeah, the four thousand dollar green chair. We you know was, and that story, of course, is in my book. But uh, uh, yeah, that that chair I, I had for many years, and then gave to a friend of mine who, when I was moving out of one of my offices, I said, I'm going to get rid of this chair. He said, give it to me. And I said, why do you want it? It was all beat up. And he goes, oh, that's like the throne, man. That's even, you know, you made all your money in that chair and you're, all your, you're, you're from, from rags to riches in that chair. And, and to this day, he still has that chair. That's really, really cool. I love <laughs> hearing that. All right. So we'll, we'll wrap it up on this last question. This is one that, that you specifically replied to and said, uh, the question is subconsciously self-sabotaging yourself. How might one break that when you might not know it's there? Yeah. Well, okay. Again, that's something that I is near and dear to me because I was a victim of self-sabotage. And that's because, you know, when I, you know, growing up, and look, any, anybody, we can all go back and find things that we did that we're not proud of. Uh, every one of us. And, and, you can believe that you're a bad person <laughs> or you can believe whatever you want to believe about it, but you assign the meaning to your past and feeling deserving is probably the most important element of succeeding at anything, whether it's trading, I don't care what it is, but feeling deserving. And that's the problem with impoverished kids that grow up in poverty they just don't feel deserving. They don't feel like they deserve it. You know, when you get someone who grows up in a, in a rich family and goes to a, an Ivy league school, they feel like they're supposed to be there. They're supposed to be there. They're supposed to get a good job. They're supposed to be rich. That feels like something that is just normal and is, is uh, uh, something that their family uh, showed them the way. And you just feel in, it's entitled, of course. Right. So, and I know a lot of people don't like when people feel entitled, but you have to feel somewhat entitled. If you, if you don't feel entitled uh, and you feel like you're undeserving, then you're going to self-sabotage yourself. So one of the ways of feeling deserving is to really take a look at yourself and 
what are you ashamed of? You know, and forgive yourself, forgive yourself and, and change the meaning behind it. You know, my, the meaning, you know, for the things that I've done in my past, I realized that the meaning behind it is that that's how I was brought up. That's what I was shown. And I mimicked, you know, the people, I didn't have good role models and I mimicked them, but then I went and found new role models and I learned from that. And I found good role models and positive role models. And, and, you know, because I put in that hard work and because I'm committed to that work, I do deserve success because I put in the work and I, and I've, and I've made the changes to be a better person. And to this day, you know, no one's perfect. I'm certainly far from perfect and always trying to, you know, better myself. And so that's the key. The key is to, you know, feel deserving and to, and to forgive yourself, be kind to yourself. You know, Mark, that, that reminded me of a quote from Tim Ferriss. And I don't know if it's his original quote or not, but he says that uh, you are the average of the five people you spend the most of your time with. And in this day and age, we are blessed beyond belief because we can watch YouTube videos, we can watch podcasts, we can read books, we can, you know, look over the shoulder of successful people like on Twitter, things like that. I don't think enough people really take advantage and really con conceptually grasp that you don't need to be around your deadbeat friends, right? You don't need to be taking financial advice from somebody who doesn't know how to make money. And, you know, relationship advice from somebody whose marriage is falling apart, et cetera. I got to say, I am so grateful that you have written these books and that you take the time to speak with me and others and to put as much content as you do out there on Twitter, especially where people can uh, reach you, learn from you and, you know, make, make an impact from you. And hopefully they are using you as one of their five people to help elevate them and their success. Well, I there's just a real quick make a point about that. And in, in my book, Mindset Secrets, I talk about building your your board of advisors. I don't know if you remember seeing that your board of directors. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have you know growing up, I didn't have access to champions that I could hang around with. I hung around with deadbeats, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, so. But I didn't turn out to be a deadbeat because what I did was I hung around with champions through books and audio tapes. And you're not going to get that from one read. All right. You want to hang around with a champion, read a champion's book 50 times. Okay. I know that sounds crazy, but I've read books 50 times. I have books that I've read 50 times and I can essentially recite them from cover to cover. And that's what I did growing up. I said, I'm going to fully immerse myself with the best thinkers, the champions and read every one of these books over and over and over until I literally internalize them and they become part of the, my fiber. And that's how I hung around with a better crowd. And then later on, when I got successful, I was, you know, you start hanging around with successful people. <laughs> and when I didn't need it, I started hanging around with successful people that would have been nice if I could hang around with them early on. But I did, there's a lot of people that were my friends and my advisors that they don't even know it because they were through their, their books. And hopefully my books do the same for people, for some people out there. You know, I got to say, you're hitting the nail so hard on the head. And, and um, you know, I heard somebody say that, um, you know, a book is the greatest investment you can ever make, you know, for like 18 bucks or whatever. You can learn, you know, Mark Minervini's full trading mindset. You know, let, let's say $36 total for these two. Mark literally spells out exactly how he trades. It, it doesn't get to a better deal than that. <laughs> Books are, the, I think books are the most underrated, underappreciated practically thing on earth. I mean, because you're absolutely right for 20 bucks, 30 bucks, you can get, and, and there's a lot of crappy books too, but I, I know, I, I always say books are like, uh, I've never met a bad kid and I've never met a, read a bad book because there's always something in even a bad book that you can learn. And, and, you know, you're right. I mean, it's just for a, a measly sum, you get a life experience. That first book, my first book, I spent 12 years writing. Really? Yes. I started working that on that 12 years earlier and I worked on it little at a time. Um, I got asked to write a book. 10 or 12 years earlier by McGraw Hill. And, um, I, I, and I, I started writing the book and then I decided I wasn't going to write a book and then time went by. And then I said, Oh, well, maybe I will. So I worked on it some more. And then finally, when I decided to, then I worked on it real hard for a couple of years. There's a lot of work in that. And then the next book took me two years. Um, I got better as a writer. And then the final book, this mindset secrets that took me under a year. 
how do you write? Do you sit down and just do a few words at a time or do you go for bl big blocks or how do you do it? I have sort of, I have a couple rules to writing. One is to never, ever force it. Mm. So never try to force writing. The other is to never try to be perfect, to just spill your brain and just worry about the details later and, and spelling and grammar and, you know, and, and everything and structure and just get the magic, you know, spill it out. So I always keep a recorder with me and a mm. pad and a pen. So I, my best thinking happens in the car when I'm driving and on the toilet for some reason. I don't know why, <laughs> but those are the two places I get my best ideas. So I always mm. keep pads and pens there. And, um, but yeah, I just, uh, uh, so, and, and then I don't structure, I don't go in with an outline. My editor really didn't like this at all because they like to have an outline and then you work through the outline. I basically put it all out there and just it's sort of a mess. And then I decide, okay, this goes here, that goes there. And I start moving around. I just want to get, because I'm trying to make every single sentence, every paragraph, every page, every chapter great. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm just, to me, later on, it's just a matter of putting all a whole bunch of great pieces all together if I get it right. And uh, so that, that's just how I do it. And like I said, it drives, it drives the editors crazy. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, Mark, I got to ask the uh, Master Trader program last year. What it was virtual, right? Yes. And is that the same for this year? Yes, it is. How's that going? Are are you are you ready for it? Is it in September again? It's in November this year. November yeah. this year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. We'll be we're eleven years doing it, so it's uh, it's been honed down to a to really a, a I think a, a perfect program from start to finish. It really is probably the thing I'm out of all of all the uh, services and things, uh, things that I've, uh, you know, produced over the year. I think it's the thing I'm most proud of hey, this year. We have uh, Larry Height who, uh, Oh really? He's going to be and not a big part of it, but he is going to be, uh, he's going to speak and, and do a section with me. So he has the, the book called the rule. Of course. I just and read that like two weeks ago. Yeah. So, so just think about this. I have Larry Height who I'm reading when I first started trading in, mm -hmm. in, you know, in market wizards and new market wizards, right? Uh, the first two market wizards book books, I'm reading Larry Height. And now, you know, 30 years later, or whatever it is, you know, Larry Height is going to be in my program. David Ryan, who's my co-instructor, mm -hmm. 25, 30 years ago, I'm sitting in the audience watching him and O'Neill and, and learning and starting to, you know, learn about stocks and he's winning the U S investing championship. I hadn't won a U.S. investing championship yet. I hadn't been in a market wizards book yet. None of that has happened, but I, and now, you know, 30 years later, David Ryan is my co-instructor. Tom Basso is also going to be. Oh, wow. So now we got four you, market. Wizards. Yeah. I was about to say, geez, you got a full house there. <laughs> so, yeah. We got a full house. So Tom Basso is in the new market wizards, you know, uh -huh. and I'm, and I, of course, I read that. I think the Market Wizards, you know, books are are are, are like the uh, the Bibles, of course. Yes. Uh, like most people do. Um, yeah. You know, Paul Tudor Jones in there, and all the great traders. Uh, so yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun this year. Oh uh, man, it's it's so much fun chatting with you on this. So yeah, I just read Larry Heights, uh, The Rule, and um, leading up to this, I read all of the Market Wizard books backwards. Um, so starting with, uh, I think it's Unknown, which just recently came out, and then Hedge oh, right. Fund. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Then then uh, Hedge Fund, then the new, and then the original. And I, I wish I could remember because it was the best quote I've ever heard, and I and and it just knocked me like knocked me over laughing. It was, um, I think it was in Hedge Fund. I couldn't remember who, but he was saying that um, he had just started his hedge fund. He was basically a one man operation. He. Uh, was working out of his home and he, he just cleared a $30,000 trade and um, he got up and he said, I felt like the master of the universe. And he's walking around <laughs> his chest all puffed up and everything yeah. is awesome. And he goes and he tells his wife and she goes, that's nice. Uh, you still need to take out the trash. And I laughed <laughs> so hard at that because that's my life. <laughs> yeah, I read I, that has to be in, in one of the earlier ones because I remember reading that. Oh, I laughed so hard at that because I th that's exactly how my wife is. And um, yeah, so I it, it, and she's like, right yeah. back down to earth. Yeah. Oh, totally. Like, <laughs> so, yeah. So, so funny. Well, that's so cool that you're going to have all that. That's that that full house for the. Uh, master trader program that so is it going to be uh, uh, like virtual and in person or just virtual 
No, it's just virtual. Okay, you know. gotcha. Yeah, there's still travel restrictions. It'd be very hard to get everybody to come and and be comfortable in person nowadays because we still, you know, much of the world still has a a, a big problem with COVID. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh... and, and we've got we've got I believe I don't remember exactly how many, but sixty something countries sometimes come. You know, wow. One year. So yeah, it, it's when 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 you come to a master trader program live, you're meeting people from every part of the world it's really something else I and mean, more than half of the people are actually from outside the u.s which is pretty interesting what gives you the biggest thrill in your business activities is it your your day-to-day uh working with your your uh private access there is it um the interactions you get on the internet is it um seeing people and seeing the difference that that it makes for you what's what's your biggest fulfillment my biggest fulfillment that's easy for, for business is when I hear somebody say, Hey, you, you know, you, you helped change my life here and, you know, thank you. know, and, and, and I've had an impact, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's, that's the whole reason why, you know, why I'm doing this. The whole reason why, you know, my wife argues with me every day to tell me to stop, <laughs> you know, cause she wants me to com- com- you know, completely retire and just spend time enjoying my, you know, with myself and her and my daughter and thinks that, you know, I don't need any more money and I don't need to you know, prove myself with any more success, but I, but I feel like I still have a lot to share. So, and, and I love seeing, uh, especially when they're young people, you know, I try to speak at colleges and, and I just spoke at the, uh, uh, University of uh, Central Florida just recently. We did a Zoom session. You know, I saw these young kids and they're so smart and sharp, man. It's just, uh, and they're just, just great, you know, and all they need is that confidence and a little, a little bit of push. And, and, you know, you've got, you've got the next market wizard there. And mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's awesome. And, and again, it's not about having to make money. A lot of these people are rich, you know, have rich parents and they don't really have any much to worry about. Like I did. I, you know, I, I need, wanted to make money. I needed money. I was broke, but it's, it's about seeing the passion. You know, I, I, I spoke at the university of Maryland with, you know, you've heard of Dr. Wish. Um, I no, don't I don't know Dr. Wish. Well, yeah. If you don't know Dr. Wish, you should check him out on Twitter. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, he uh, runs a stock program at the university of maryland and i spoke there and it was a pretty big crowd live a couple of years back and i had these uh you know these young kids coming up to me and saying you know my my uh mom and dad want me to be a doctor but i really don't want to i want to be a stock trader you know and they were so passionate about the stocks and uh, you know again i i yeah you know, that passion is so important I mean, you don't you don't want to do something that you don't enjoy and that you're stuck in a job that, uh, and meanwhile, you left your passion, you know, on the burner because you want to please, you know, your parents or something you want. Now that's the one thing I, I have to say that I had, that was, that was a, a big plus for me is that my parents supported me no matter what I did. You know, if I told my father that I was going to be, a, you know, I was going to be a, uh, a garbage man, he'd say nothing against garbage men. But if, if I told him I was going to be a drug dealer, he'd say, well, let's make sure you, you be the best drug dealer there is. Uh-huh. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know? And I'm right there with you. I'm going to support you in it. You know, I mean, my father really never judged me and just, you know, and my mother just supported me a hundred percent. You know, even when I started trading stocks, my father was like, I have no idea what you're doing, but you know, I wish you the best, be great at it, make a ton of money. It's be wonderful. But uh, they, they didn't really understand the stock market. So speaking of being great, you are once again entered into the U.S. Investing Championship. And for the fulfillment aspect of it, several of your students are there as well. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, there's a lot of uh, people that, uh, you know, they're my members, if you will, um, you know, from uh, not many of any private access clients and also some that uh, came to the seminar uh, in previous years, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's great. You know, Norm Zeta started the competition again after a you know, long hiatus. I, I was um, surprised to see that, but it's taken off. I mean, there's uh, this year there's 300 and I think 34 contest participants, so it's really taken off. And uh, hopefully, I've been able to help him. I've been trying to tweet it as much as possible and and help bring that awareness and and encourage you know our members to uh, to compete in it. So yeah, it's it's a wonderful to go out there and to and, and the main thing is it's the it really is the gold standard because it's real money. 
mm-hmm. you know, and it's not like a thousand dollar contest, you know, where someone puts the whole thing into a penny stock. And yeah, this, this is real money. Even the, the smallest division is 20,000 and the l- larger division, the division that I'm in this year is 1 million plus. I put up 1.2 million of my own money. Um, so it's, it's a real money contest and, and it's awesome, you know? So where are you at so far? In my division, I it was the last month I'm in first place. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> where, where else would I want to be? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that answer. I was just asking to get you to, to say it. <laughs> well, Mark, this has been an absolute pleasure. I, I I mean, we've done nearly an hour and it just flew by like that. I uh, I got to say, I am so grateful to be able to uh, be on your, your radar again. And I, I really appreciate the time so much to have you come on the show. Yeah. Well, you're awesome. You're very professional. I think you've got a hell of a career for yourself. If you're not a stock trader, you certainly have a career in this field. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. I've been on TV a hell of a lot lately. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's been fun. And, and um, you know, you talked about goal boards earlier. I have mine over there and there's three different pictures of me um, like Photoshopped onto different uh, uh, financial networks. So oh, awesome. Yeah. Well, that's, I that's why you... I started the podcast is I was like, I'm, yeah. I'm going to get in there one way or another. Well, you're, you're, uh, you're getting pretty polished. I got to tell you, you're, 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 you're definitely much more polished than you were the, the last time I was on with you. So it, you're, you're doing great. Well, I, 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 I'm so humbled and appreciate that, Mark. You know, I'm trying to be the best, but I'll never awesome. be as good as you. Well, I'll, I'll try and be second best. <laughs> of course you will. Of course you will. Everybody can be better than me because you're the net, you guys are the next generation. It, we look, we are encoded to be better than the previous. Everybody, we're, we're, we, you know, we broke the four minute mile and then, you know, we, uh, uh, we break records all the time and the, the kids of tomorrow are going to be way better than us today. And that's, uh, you're, you're the future. You're, you're young and, and filled with energy and dreams. And you guys are the future, man. And that's what I want to see. I want to see everybody do better than me. That's the goal. Well, I got to tell you, if you catch somebody early on enough, then that makes a huge difference. Cause I spent, yeah. Oh geez. I don't know. Four years learning how to trade the wrong way, not making any money. And then I had to unlearn everything and then learn the right way to make money. And now I'm making money. And I was like, if I had those four years back, I would be so much further ahead than I am right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. But just so. remember you're right where you're supposed to be because that's why that where you are, wherever you are right now is that's the, where you're supposed to be because that's where you are. So that's part of, of your development. So it, it's, it's embrace it. I had a very tough childhood. I had a tough upbringing. I had a lot of strikes against me. I wouldn't change it for the world. I wouldn't change one bit of it because that's what made me me. And I like where I am now. It's not how you start. It's where you finish. Well, on that note, we'll wrap it up and finish there. Mark, thank you so much for coming on today's podcast. I, I couldn't imagine having any more gratitude than I have right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. It's been wonderful. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for tuning in to today's How to Trade Stocks Options podcast. Make sure you like, subscribe, and enable notifications. That way you never miss any of the tools, tips, and tricks that we upload every single week to help you trade faster and trade smarter. I'll see you on the next episode. Hey, if you like this video, let me know by leaving me a like below and then subscribe and share it with somebody you think could use it as well. Be sure to comment below with your biggest takeaway from this episode and any suggestions you have for future episodes. And finally, make sure you watch these other videos to help you trade faster and trade smarter, and I'll see you on the next episode.